our extension plant pathologist, Dr. Babesh Dunn. Dr. Babesh, we'll let you take it away. Thank you, Kel. Uh, well, one before I start, I would like to acknowledge our USDA appropriation funds, uh, which is instrumental in generating a lot of the data which we are presenting today. I'd also like to acknowledge our cooperating uh, institutions like Fort Valley State University, uh, University of Georgia, and also USDA Vegetable Labor Labor Laboratory, Charleston. Also, uh, some of the data, most of the data which I'm going to present today is uh, actually uh, been uh, generated by my uh, uh, PhD student, Dr. Uh, Mr. Clarence Codot. He's a PhD student with me and Dr. Bob Camerite. And uh, also, my collaborators, a very close collaborator, Dr. Uh, Stormy Sparks and uh, Ted McAvoy, and my uh, extension horticulture predecessors like uh, Dr. Tim Kulong and Dr. Andre Da Silva. So, anyway, uh, also I'd like to acknowledge our cooperating county extension agents. They have been instrumental in collecting the wildfly survey data and, that, and helped Florence in generating those data. So, a lot of whatever I'm showing is a summary of a lot of sweat and work from the last three, four years. So, what are you seeing here? If I can show my I don't know if you look at my, oh yes, cursor is visible. Look at the amount of whitefly pressure we can get in Tift, it means in southern Georgia under ideal conditions. So this condition occurred in 2016 and 2017 when we lost nearly 40 to 50 percent of our yellow squash and other squash crops in the fall and we lost 70 percent of snap beans in the fall. I'm going to show you some numbers how much dollars we lost. The similar conditions occurred in 2022. Now, what happened since 17 and 2022? So we did a good bit of research. We, our growers have been mindful in following area-wise pest management, and a lot of the outcomes which we extended seems fruitful because despite that much population, same as earlier years, we have not seen that loss. So that shows the impact of the funding and of the, of the, of the close collaboration with the ex specialists and county extension agents. Uh, today, um, my talk, I will focus only on one host, which is a yellow squash, highly susceptible host to Gemini viruses. Uh, this is extreme symptom you will see. This is a two-month-old crop. This is how infected uh, plants going to look like. You, uh, you will see, first of all, you may not see any fruiting under, ideal, under heavy infestation. But if you see fruiting, those, fruiting, those fruits will be either misshaped, misshapen, or they will be green. So they're unmarketable. Now, uh, in Georgia, whenever you, whenever you see the cucurbit leaf crumple virus disease, it's not a result of only one virus. It can be a combination of different, different viruses. Speci specifically, cucurbit leaf crumple virus, cucurbit yellow stunt disorder virus, or in some cases, CCYV, cucurbit chlorotic yellow virus. So Dr. Sudip Bak, I don't know if he's in the audience, he, will, he has figured out two or three, he has found two or three different viruses. So there's a slew of viruses we are seeing um, in, in, uh, in southern Georgia, but major contributor of these, of these particular symptoms are cucurbit leaf compromise virus and cucurbit yellowstone disorder viruses. So why we are seeing these issues, why this has th these things have become a problem? Dr. Sparks and Dr. Raleigh has done an excellent work where they have shown that uh, the insecticide, the traditional insecticides, is losing its efficacy slowly, okay? And uh, that's a big concern. Increased tolerance in wildflowers to commonly use insecticides is a concern. And other thing, we don't have commercial varieties, in especially, specifically in yellow squash, which are resistant or tolerant to these viruses. Now, there are two different things. Insect resistance, variety, insect resistant varieties, and virus resistant variety. Your, your variety can be resistant to insect, or maybe tolerant to insect or to tolerant to white fly, but they not, may not be tolerant to the virus. So they're two different things, they're apple and oranges. So what I'm talking here is these varieties don't have any resistance to viruses. So this is the loss. Look at this number, $38 million. This is a very, very conservative value that occurred in fall of 2017 when we had that issue, that incidence. 
Well, the, the crop loss estimates for 2022 has not been um, generated yet, but my belief is that it will be way, way, way less than $38 million, despite the same level of populations. All right, so what we have decided, what we have to do, so to find what are the different factors, apart from insecticides, what other things we can do that can um, dictate or that can determine future virus incidence in the crop. For example, a grower, while uh, planting his squash crop in the, in the fall, what are the things he should keep in mind? What are the factors he should keep in mind before doing it? Or whether he should do it or not? That's, that's the thing. First of all, what we evaluated, the type of squash and squash cultivars we can utilize in the fall, or is it safe enough to utilize? So if you go with the yellow squash versus winter squash, we looked at seven, uh, 11 different squash cultivars, and we planted these cultivars in two different planting dates, August 20th and September 14th. Why these dates were chosen? Based on our, uh, our experience and our survey data, we have found that the peak of this white fly we usually see around end of August to first to second week of September. That's why we chose first end of the peak and later end of the peak. So August 20th and September 14th. And we chose, we chose two different types of squash, yellow squash and winter squash, different varieties. So look at this panel first. So plant, the squash, winter and yellow squash planted on August 20th, early of white fly peak. Irrespective of the peak, whether you plant early or plant later, the highly susceptible variety, which is a commonly grown variety in a fall, is gold price is susceptible to viruses. So what you're, this, this is actually a virus incidence over time, okay? You can get 100% incidence, irrespective when you plant it. But this whole bunch of virus incidences, therefore, therefore the varieties belong to winter squash. So winter squash are inherently, inherently had some level of tolerance against these viruses. Now, when I say tolerance, tolerance is different, different than resistance. Tolerance means the, path, the host can get infected, but it will not, your yield will not be impacted. Where resistance is, it means host will not be impacted, it will be not be impacted, will be infected at all. But in case of winter squash, they are tolerant. It means they have, they can get infected, but you will not see their impact on the yield. So what we have shown here, irrespective of the planting date, the winter squash are inherently tolerant compared to the yellow squash. Uh, moving on, in 2021, when we looked at uh, 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 different planting date, we chose, we broadened our planting date range from August 17th to <coughs> October 15th. We went beyond the peak. And we planted just two squash. We planted zucchini squash and yellow squash. So this line, upper line, is a zucchini squash. So you can see August 17th, August 17th August to September 15th, the virus incidence was, comp was significantly higher for yellow squash when, you, when, you, when compared to later planting dates like September 30th and October 15th. So look at this line, virus incidence in, in yellow squash, is, it was way, way higher, but look at it in October 15th. Beyond October 15th, if you plant it, you will not have a virus. But you have to think about the market. You may not have the market beyond it because our, we get our first freezing around October third week or sometime, uh, not October third, sorry, November third week or November second week. So your crop will not be matured by that time and you'll have a crop loss. So October 15th is just for the academic purposes, but for a practical sense, it may not. But look at the blue line, which is a zucchini. Zucchini, irrespective of these date, planting dates, zucchini was consistently lower than the yellow squash. So what is, the, what, what, what is the overall gist of this thing? So if a grower wants to grow his yellow squash, and so, so want to grow a squash, and it's a heavy white fly year, he may have to think twice that whether he should go with a yellow squash or a zucchini squash. I think he may be fine going with the zucchini squash during that year. But again, there are a lot of consideration he has to make. It's, it's a grower's decision, grower's market, grower's everything. But what we have shown that there is a difference with respect to type of squash you choose and the planting date. All right, this is the same <coughs> slide which Dr. Sparks uh, 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 
uh, presented. So uh, Clarence and Dr. Clarence Goddard and Dr. Sparks worked on this project where they looked at the insecticide program and the different planting dates. So in 2020, he had 10 planting dates. In 2021, he had eight planting dates. They, so they started planting from mid-June to uh, uh, late September. So Dr. Sparks, if you remember, he has sh shown you the white fly data. He looked and he showed you the difference between very mark versus non treated check. So there is a difference. But this is a virus data. So it shows insecticide, irrespective of the insecticide programs, the virus, the difference in virus did not occur. All the insecticide programs had a same level of, more or less same level of virus incidence compared to the non treated check. Although there are some differences here and there. The other thing which we found overall, this is a 2020 data. This is a, these are the planting dates, and these are the insecticide programs. This is 2021, this is 2022. So you can see in 2020, uh, the, uh, the virus incidence increased over time since from mid-July, and by the time you reached August 31st, it reached peak. In 2021, we had a very low white flower population, so nothing you can deduce with this particular, uh, this particular year. But 2022, was, we had a good bit, of, good bit of virus incidence. So you can see these insecticide, insecticide programs did, now means uh, the virus incidence in, among these insecticide programs, I would say the virus incidence were very, very, very high for, for the entire, entire planting dates, except for early planting dates in July 25th and July and August 1st. So what did we learn from this particular slide? Insecticide programs work, but you have to choose when you plant your crop. So planting date, matters. All right, moving on to the real culture practices. So we wanted to assess if row covers and UV reflective mulch uh, can impact virus incidence. Now UV reflective mulch has been widely used in counties like southern counties like Decatur County against white flies. It's been used, okay? And there's a good bit of evidence um, in the literature that they provide. Uh, help in reducing the white fly populations. So we wanted to see if you can combine UV reflective mulch with row covers and see a difference. So in experiment one, I'll be very slow with this one and I'll explain you. In experiment one, we have UV reflective mulch and we did not put a row cover. And another treatment, we have reflective mulch with row cover. The row cover was put on the plant until flowering, means it's just for one, it's just for 10 days. After 10 days, we remove the cover. It, it doesn't mean that the entire, for the entire crop period, our squash was under the row cover, it's not that. Right after transplanting, we covered the rows just for 10 days, then we remove the rows. Just for 10 days of covering, I'll show you how much impactful it is in reducing the virus. Okay, uh, our other treatments were uh, white mulch, our general white plastic mulch, no cover and white plastic mulch with cover. So this is a picture. This is on reflective plastic mulch with a row cover. On the side, side by side, we have reflective mulch, uh, reflective mulch with a, without a row cover. Parallelly, we also had an experiment where we wanted to be a little innovative and we, want, we used uh, floating row covers. How, I don't know how many of you have seen floating row covers or strawberry row covers. It covers six rows at a time. Not a single row, it covers six rows at a time. And uh, we had a similar treatment. Uh, we had UV refractive mulch with floating row covers, no row covers, uh, white, uh, white mulch with row cover, and white mulch without row covers. Let's look at the data. So what we saw, this, is, this shows the virus incidence, sorry, a, a number of adult white flies in, uh, 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 reflect, sorry, in non, in a white plastic with no cover. So you can see the numbers increased from September 10th and decreased by September 30th. But look at the uh, uh, UV reflective mulch and the white fly adult counts here. Where is my cursor? It stayed low throughout. There, although there was a peak, it stayed low and, and it was undetermined after to, to September 28th. Moreover, you can see the significant difference between adult counts in reflective mulch versus white mulch. So there is a difference. So there is a benefit of using UV reflective mulch. Now I'm going to show you 
how does uh, how did the row covers work? So irrespective, you put the row cover on reflective mulch or on the white plastic, it had the same effect. It reduced the virus, uh, the adult counts significantly compared to your reflective mulch. So let's let's look at the virus incidence for this particular treatment for this particular experiment. Here you can see when you have a white plastic, no cover, virus incidence was as high as 70 percent. It can move up and reach up to 70 percent. This is the virus incidence on reflective mulch. It was significantly lower. Look at the at the end of the experiment. Reflective mulch had nearly 30 percent virus incidence, whereas your normal mulch has 70 uh, percent virus incidence. Now look at these two lines. I don't know, do not know. These lines are flat. These are covered row covers lines. So irrespective of UV mulch or white mulch, if you cover your crop for 10 days, you will significantly reduce the virus incidence. Let's look at the yield. When you compare the yield with reflective mulch versus white mulch, there's significant gain with yield. And when you co compare the covers versus no cover, you can see the significant gain with the covered when you cover your rows. In experiment two, similar observations. Here we use the floating row covers where we covered six rows at a time. It has the same level, same, we made the same observations as we observed with the single row cover. So row covers for first 10 days helps in reducing adult white flag counts and consequently help in reducing virus incidence at the end of the season. Okay, so what did we learn here? Two things, UV mulch works. If a grower just want to work with the UV, uh, doesn't want to, want to use a row cover, they can go only with the UV mulch. If the grower is really serious, wants to go with the row covers, they can go with the row covers only, they don't have to use the UV mulch and they will get a additive effect of not using uh, UV mulch. So these are the two takeaway points from these. All right, now next question, can we combine all the tactics? We knew planting dates work. If you plant early, if you plant a little later, you will have a lesser adult counts and virus incidence. We also know UV mulch reduce virus incidence compared to the non-UV mulch or normal mulch, and we also know the row covers work. work. In this experiment, we combined all three. We, we, we combined row covers, UV mulch, and planting dates. This is what we saw. We did this ex results of two experiments. In 2021, it's not so conclusive. We had a throughout low white flow uh, population, and consequently, we had a very low virus incidence. But in 2022, when we planted August 1st, before the peak, way before the peak, not this mulching and this row cover didn't have much effect because we have a low white flow population. Look at this. This was planted on August 23rd. These upper lines, can you guess what these upper lines are? These are, these are the treatments where the, where the rows were not covered. These are only for the mulch. Here, mulch did not work. I would not say, yeah, seems like it did not work. But here, in these two lines, row covers work. So if you go, when we, we made the similar observation also when we planted on September 14th. So October 23rd, sorry, August 23rd and on September 14th is within the time period of white flag peak. During the white flag peak, you may think of using the row covers rather than your mulch. That's what this data says. But we'll be repeating this trial again in 2023. Okay, next question. Do planting materials matter? Do planting materials, or like what type of plants we use, for example, do we, do, the, do we use transplant or direct seed, does it matter in reducing virus or increasing the virus incidence? And my data shows yes. For example, if you do the direct seeding, let's say we did the direct seeding around the peak of the white fly season, and we saw a greater increase, a significantly higher increase in virus incidence. But when we transplanted uh, 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 during the same period, we did not see that difference. It means 
But if you do direct seeding, your, your seedlings will be exposed in the field for a longer period for the white fly feeding. As a result, you will have more white fly, more viruses. Whereas we start with the seedlings, they're already a little boosted and they have, they will uh, gain ground uh, quite quicker and they'll be a little bit tolerant to the white fly feeding and the subsequent, subsequent uh, virus incidents. So more or less this says that Direct seeding is not a good idea in the fall when you have a high white fly pressure. Now, we know all these things. We know how things work. Uh, we do have some sense how different cultural practices uh, uh, work in the field in reducing or in increasing the white fly uh, viruses risk. Our question is, we move a little up and uh, forward and ask the question, can we predict virus incidence based on, what we, based on these variables? So, uh, for example, we knew that date of planting, or planting date, mulch type, row covers, type of squash you're using, planting, and planting material can impact diseases, white fly transmitted viruses. Based on these variables, can we predict virus incidence in the fall? We know, how many of you are aware of the peanut RX? We know what peanut RX, how they started with. They started with few variables, okay? And they wanted to see if these variables can predict the risk of peanut spotted wilt. Similar concept we wanted to check and we wanted to test in squash against these viruses. We may call it later squash RX. So when uh, Clarence did a random forest analysis, what does it mean? It will tell you out of those six variables, which variable is 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 good predictor of your virus incidence. So he found the planting date, as we saw in any cases, every case, planting date is very important, followed by type of squash you choose, either uh, zucchini squash or yellow squash, followed by mulch type, UV mulch or um, white mulch, followed by row covers, and then planting material. So this, is, this pie chart shows the contribution of each variable in predicting the, 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 the virus incidence. So you can see the uh, squash type and plant index are almost equal predictor, one large predictor, followed by type of mulch, row covers, and planting material. Now, based on these value, based on these information, and based on the trials over the last three years, we were able to assign certain risks number to each variable and sub-variables. I'm going to tell you that. I'm going to show you what. So for example, the, our first variable is type of squash. For type of squash, if you use a yellow squash, we gave it a high risk number of 50 compared to the winter squash, 5. Planting date, if you plant, after, uh, if you plant uh, between October 20, uh, sorry, August 26 and September 20, you are at a high risk. We gave it a high risk point of 50 compared to if you plant after September 20, which is 10, or before August 11, which is 20. Now, insect-proof row covers, if you, if you do not use row cover at a high risk, we give a high risk point of 20 compared to use of row cover, five. Mulch, and so forth. So based on that, we came up uh, for the low risk, the number range from 40 to 80. If you're within 40 to 80, you might be at lower risk. If you are between 85 to 110, you might be moderate risk. And if you are with uh, 115 and more, you are a very high risk. And all these risk points are for the fall planting. And what we did, we looked, we found, when we did the correlation, we found a very strong positive correlation between the different, the risk points we have shown and the disease incidence. It shows whatever the risk points we have chosen, it, it, it matters biologically, it means it makes sense. We moved forward, we wanted to test all the risk points and see if this combination of the risk points are valid. When we, <clears throat> when we did, I don't, I'm not gonna show the data here, but I'm gonna give, the, give you the gist, that based on our trials, what we have seen, a strong correlation between the risk points that we have assigned and the virus incidents that we observed in the field. So, so the gist of this thing is this, Based on three or four years of trials, we developed those risk points. 
we have assigned those risk points to each variables, to each factors which you, growers can utilize. Now, from past year, we started validating those risk points, and we found whatever the risk points we have assigned to these variables, they are actually biologically valid. Although, a lot of improvements, a lot of iterations has to be made. For example, peanut RS took 35 years to, to fine tune, and this is just the second or third year of our what we've been doing. It has a long way to go, but it's a very good start, and we have gained a good bit of information what we've been doing with this virus and the practices. With this, I'd like to uh, uh, conclude my presentation, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody got any questions for Dr. Babesh? I was within the time. Okay. Any questions for Dr. Babesh? Okay. All right. Dr. Dudley, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you.